All right. Hello, everyone. Let's get started. Uh, is anyone at my keynote where, where I presented some slides? So uh, I have no slides. I have no energy left for doing slides anymore. So this is going to be um, all code. Uh, if you want to follow along, you can uh, contact me on Twitter up there. And the code that we're going to go through is on this GitHub account, um, including the script that I'm going to be kind of following. So if you want to go back over the code a bit later, feel free. Uh, can I have a quick show of hands? Who's using Spring Boot 1.2 at the moment? Um, hopefully, it's just about got enough. So, it's a Spring Boot application, nothing much magic about that. We have a, a really simple domain. We have a user entity, which just consists of an ID, some username, and uh, a vehicle identification number. So, this is a, a VIN number for a car. And then, um, if you if you jump into, I don't know if you've seen these. Um, if you've used Hibernate before, you can use these kind of value types for, for kind of simple things. So a VIN number is effectively a string, but it has some kind of rules about it. So a VIN number has to be exactly 17 uh, characters. So in order to give that logic a place to live, I like to use these uh, value objects to, to contain them. So we have this VIN number object that just pretty much wraps a string. And then we have a bit of um, Hibernate ceremony to tell Hibernate how to get that VIN number into the database and back out again, uh, which is uh, one of these attribute converters if you've not seen them before. So this basically says, take a VIN number and give me a string for the database. And then there's two methods, one to go into the database and one to come back out again. Uh, we have, after that, we have a, a fairly simple remote service that we're going to call. So the idea is that we're going to write this little web service you're going to be able to hit it with a username, and it's going to look up that user in the database, find the VIN number, and then call some remote third-party service that's able to take a VIN number and tell me some details about the car. So the, uh, the vehicle um, details service is this kind of simple interface. Get, get the details given a VIN number. Throw this exception if I can't find it. And then we have um, a remote implementation that uses Spring's REST template just to do a remote call. Uh, we also have this kind of properties class that's just holding the, um, the URL that, that is going to be this remote service. And for, for this example, I've got one set up locally, and I've mocked it out. Um, the final thing we've got is this controller class. So this is the main entry point. Um, and we've basically got get methods for given a username and a vehicle. Then I'm going to give you either plain text or JSON, which is just the, the details of the car. Um, I should briefly explain this thing as well. Uh, one technique I like to use when I'm doing MVC controllers is to try and keep them as light as possible. So try and take the logic that you might be tempted to put in your controller and put it somewhere else. And you'll see a bit later as we go through the tests why that helps. So in this case, so the controller is delegating off to this user vehicle service thing. And if we look at this, it's just a pretty straightforward um, component. And its only real job is to um, mediate between two other services, which is the repository that's going to return the users so, and the, um, the remote service that we're going to call. So you can see. Uh, get vehicle details, given a username, we'll just do the repository call, get it from the database, deal with the fact that a user might not be there, 
and then call the remote service and actually return the stuff. Uh, so maybe I'll briefly just show you two other things. This app is um, running against a real database. So I have uh, MySQL running, and I've got one user kind of set up, one test user, Mickey, and the VIN number, 123456, blah, blah, blah. And uh, <coughs> I've also got uh, Wiremock running. So if you've not seen uh, Wiremock before, it's a quick way of mocking out a, a service uh, actually on the wire. So uh, this is, you can launch this one with Maven with a different profile, and then it is effectively running standalone wire mock uh, and looking at this file here, which is just saying, okay, every time I get a call to this URL, I'm going to return this response. So if I um, if I jump over here and I can I can curl that, then I just get this kind of mock response coming back every time. So the developer of this application has been kind enough to provide tests, or I should say a test, uh, and they've just provided one, which is not particularly great. And this thing is a full kind of integration test. So this is the way you would potentially write a test if you were doing a Spring Boot 1.3 application. So I'll just talk through the bits. Start the test and run it with Springs, JUnit Class Runner. Uh, I want it to be an integration test for a web app. And I want to use a random port because I don't want um, the test to fail just because I happen to have left Tomcat running. I'm going to configure it as if it's a Spring Boot application, and I'm going to point the main configuration to load, which is the main application class. So that's going to kind of kick off the whole thing. I'm going to inject this local server port value thing, which tells me which port the random port actually started on. I'm going to use REST template, and then I'm going to actually hit the real service. So if I um, run this test, um, you can see it's quite, it's quite slow. Uh, if I jump over to Wiremock, you'll probably see uh, some, of the, some of the output actually happening live. So it's hitting the real, the real mock service. It's hitting the real database, and then it's just checking that uh, it got some data that had Honda in it. <clears throat> All right. So what I want to start with before going into the kind of new test features is if we were upgrading this app to 1.4, what's going to happen? What things can you change? Um, hopefully nothing will break, but there's definitely things you can do to make, uh, make this test better when you upgrade. So I've got... I'm basically cheating a little bit. I've got all of the commits um, set up. So I'm just going to step through uh, the various things that I've done to, to get this application upgraded. So the first one is quite obvious. It's changed the version number from 1.3 to 1.4. And I've done one other kind of little thing here that I just wanted to point out in case you've not seen them already. There's um, there's these new annotations. So I've replaced the request mapping annotation with get mapping, which is just a little bit shorter. So um, you, you lose that uh, need to have the get uh, type specified. Um, other than that, things like seem to upgrade fairly cleanly, except we've got a lot of yellow in this class. And um, the reason we've got a lot of yellow here is Basically, the test class that existed in Spring Boot 1.3 was fairly light. It didn't have much in it. And in 1.4, we've added quite a lot. So having this kind of flat structure didn't really work. So everything that was in the test package has been moved somewhere. Um, so if you upgrade, you're going to get deprecation warnings. But they're pretty straightforward to fix. Uh, I'll just run that test again just to make sure nothing's broken. OK, so, so you can see the, the actual upgrade itself for this dummy app was pretty painless. The tests still work, even though they're um, not quite as nice as they used to be, because we've got all these deprecation warnings. OK, so the next thing I want to point out is this new runner class that we get with Spring Framework 4.3. 
There's nothing wrong at all with the Spring J Unit 4 class runner. It's not been deprecated. It, it still continues to work exactly the same. It's just a little bit kind of ugly to look at, <clears throat> and it's a little bit hard to remember. So all that's happened in, in 4.3 is there's a new class that just extends it, so it acts exactly the same, and you can use it as an alternative in your tests if you want to. You don't have to. And it just, it just makes it just a little bit more readable, just a little less kind of technical looking when you're, when you're working on your test. OK. So the next thing we probably want to do is migrate away from those deprecated classes and move to Spring Boot 1.4's way of doing things. So most of them, uh, there's just simple one-to-one -one replacements. So for instance, if I look at um, the, the test rest template class that I was using before, all of the classes will say deprecated, the version that it was deprecated in, and where you can go to use a new version. So most of the time, it's going to be a simple, like, organize imports and pick one that's not in the test package. There is one uh, slight difference with Spring Boot 1.4 in that we've tried to simplify the way that you annotate a test to actually load configuration. So uh, there isn't a one-to-one -one mapping between those old annotations and the Spring Boot test, but it's pretty straightforward to move. So uh, what I've done here is instead of web application test and the random port equals true, I've got Spring Boot test. Web environment is a way of telling uh, the test framework, what type of um, web environment you want. And there are um, a few options. You can have a mock one, which is the default, which is mock MV, uh, a mock uh, web application context. You can start a real application server on a random port. You can start a real application server on the default or a defined port. Or you can say, I don't want any of that, and I just want a, a non-web application context. Oh, uh, by the way, if this isn't clear or there's anything you want to ask, just shout and interrupt me. It, we've got like a lot to get through, but if, if anything's confusing or I'm speaking too fast, just interrupt. Uh, so the other thing that we've done is get rid of that configuration class, and we've just directly in Spring Boot test said, OK, which class do you want to load? The application class. So everything else is, is pretty much the same. Um, there's actually more we can do here because there's some more smarts that this annotation's got that the old ones didn't have. And the first thing we can do is drop that classes thing. So what happens here is if I've got a Spring Boot test annotation and I don't define which class I want it to load and I don't have any static configuration defined inside the test itself, then it's going to start searching for your application class. So what it's actually going to do is pick the current package and then look in that and then gradually look up the package hierarchy until it finds a class that's annotated with Spring Boot application. Um, actually, to be really precise, it's going to look for a class that's annotated with Spring Boot configuration. So if you don't use, if you don't use Spring Boot application because you don't want component scanning, uh, you, you can use Spring Boot configuration. But if you're following kind of 90% of the Spring Boot style app, uh, applications, then it will just find the main, the main class for you. OK, so looking better. There's a few more things that we've done. You can now use this local server port as an annotation to inject the local server port. So you don't need to remember the fact that this is a, a value and you don't need this horrible dollar squiggly stuff. You can just use that. Um, but we can actually do even better than that because you can get rid of that and you can inject the test rest template into your test if you're using uh, the new Spring Boot test annotation. So what this is going to do is actually set up, uh, it's almost the same as the regular test rest template that you'd create yourself, except it's got a little bit of extra logic which means that if it finds a URL that's not got a, uh, that's relative, so if it starts with slash, it's going to assume that you want to hit localhost, and then it's going to pick up the port directly. Um, so this test now, I think, is in uh, almost a, a, a good enough state. There's, uh, I'll just show you it still runs, hopefully. OK, so 
you can see we've got rid of quite a lot of boilerplate code there. It's a lot, it's a lot kind of nicer to look at. There's one more thing if you're upgrading that you might want to consider doing, and that is uh, if, you've, um, if you're using an assertion library, uh, who, uses, uh, who uses just straight J units like assert equals and assert uh, true and false and stuff? A right. few. Who uses assert that with Hamcrest? Okay, f a few more. Who uses uh, assert J? Anyone heard of assert J? Okay, so if, if you, so I really, 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 really like Assert J. It's um, we've transferred our entire internal code base from Hamcrest to Assert J, and it's uh, it's really, really good. Um, so by default, we've decided to include it as a test dependency. So if you use Spring Boot Starter Test, what you're going to get is um, Assert J on the class path, and all that basically means is you can replace the standard J unit Assert that with the uh, assert J version, and you get a kind of fluent API. So the old version that I had here, I don't know if you can see that, let me zoom up. So the old version that we had, you had to uh, like assert that, the thing that you're asserting, and then you kind of have to know what to import here. You, you kind of have to know that this is, uh, okay, I need a ham crest, crest matcher that's called contain string, and you have to, you have to remember um, all that detail. With, um, with assert J, you don't. You get this kind of really nice fluent API. So if I just um, like copy that again, you, um, you can see here that what you get is like a whole bunch of assertions that are, are easy to discover. So 99% um, of the time, you can find the thing you want to do just by doing control space. And you can chain them together as well. So I could say, um, OK, I, I want to make sure it's not null, and I want to make sure that it uh, contains ignoring case, you know, Honda. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's just a really nice, um, nice API. When we migrated boot, we found that a lot of the import statements just went away. Um, okay, so the last thing that you might want to consider doing if you're upgrading is removing the auto wire annotation from your services. So previously the service looked like this, and with uh, with Spring 4.3, if you have a single constructor, uh, you don't need to declare that it's auto wired. Spring will assume that if it's a single constructor, then I'm going to try and auto wire it for you. So you only need auto wire if you've got more than one. Um, so that, again, just makes the code a bit cleaner. And the reason that you should consider um, using constructor injection is it allows you to write tests that don't necessarily involve spring, which is always a good thing. So your ideal uh, scenario should be to try and write unit tests that uh, simply start up the thing you want to test and don't involve spring and they're fast and, and nothing's confusing. Um, you only really need to involve Spring if you're starting to deal with MVC or you want to test caching or something that Spring's kind of getting involved with. Um, so I want to show you the first test that we're going to add. It's just a simple, um, it, it's just a simple test that directly instantiates this little delegate service that we've got and checks things for us. So. A few things to go through. Uh, the, I like this JUnits rules. I don't know if anyone's seen that uh, before. You can have expected exception. So you may have seen tests that do this, where you say, I expect this exception to be thrown. But I much prefer this rule, because it allows you to be much more explicit about when you expect the exception to be t thrown and what message you expect it to have. So if I had some code here that happened to throw an illegal argument exception, if I have the test up here that saying I expect this, this exception, this test will pass. Whereas really what I'm saying is I don't expect any exceptions until this point, and then I expect that an exception will be thrown afterwards. So it's, it's a great way of controlling that flow. Um, it's also pretty good because you can test the, the message. So uh, if you've got 
in, in this example, <clears throat> and, and a lot of Spring Boot's internal code will have this, you, you'll see this assert not null, this must not be null. And if you've got more than one argument, then you really ought to have a couple of tests to make sure that the different arguments cannot be null. And if you only test the exception type and not the message, you're, you, you're potentially not testing the thing at all. Uh, there's one nice thing about uh, this test as well, which is we've got consistent naming. So I quite like this style of uh, naming the test, uh, starting with the thing that you're testing, so which is often the name of a public method, but not necessarily. Optionally adding any kind of conditions that are related to it. So in this case, when I call get vehicle details, um, when the username is null, and then finally ending with what I expect to happen. So should throw an exception. So all the tests in this sample follow that kind of same rule. And uh, there's a link in one of the other classes that, that's got an article that explains why that's quite a good process to follow. All right. Uh, what else could I show you in this? Mock Who's using Mockito? Anyone using Mockito? Oh, yeah, lo loads of people. Cool. Um, so anyone using BDD variant of Mockito? Not many. OK, so I really like the VD BDD version. It's just a slightly different syntax. It does the same thing. So you may be a, a little bit confused to see Mockito annotations up here that are setting up mocks and injecting them into the test. But down here, I'm using the given version rather than what I think it's called when. In, if you're using regular um, Mockito, but it does exactly the same thing. So this is just setting up some kind of given this uh, when I do find by username and any string, I'm going to return null. Um, this one's probably a bit more better. Give, given that uh, when I find by Donald, I'm going to return a real user. Um, yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, this final thing that I should show you is that this is what I'm talking about when I'm saying a test that doesn't involve Spring. I've got no run with annotations here at all. And in order to create this class that I'm testing, I just simply have to, to create it. If I was using field injection or um, uh, setter injection, it wouldn't be quite so clean. So I really like the constructor style where I can just say, I can't possibly create this thing without doing something sensible. Um, I guess I should show you this working. What did I do? Okay, so and you also see it's, it's lightning quick. You know, there's it's there's no time at all to run that test. So, one thing that people have complained about with Spring Boot is the fact that it does all this auto configuration, which is really nice when I'm writing my own code. But when it comes to testing, I sometimes don't want everything kind of configured for me. So Spring Boot has 1.4 is going to have this idea of being able to test uh, what we call like a slice or a layer of your application. And it's just auto configuring just a smaller section. So if I'm testing the domain, I don't really need to configure the web layer. I can just test the domain. So I'll start with the simple test. This vehicle identification number thing that we had before, uh, this is another one that's not involving Spring, not doing anything special, just checking that um, I c the logic that I spoke about where I said it must be exactly 17 characters uh, makes sense. So testing less than and more than and nulls and spaces and stuff. Um, this, if you're interested in this class, uh, when you look at the code, has got the links to the, the naming suggestions and also the assert J library that you can look at if you're interested. The one that's a bit more interesting is something that is involving Spring because we need to talk, talk to a real database, and that's uh, the data JPA test. So this is the first uh, slice annotation that you can use for testing just data JPA. Otherwise, it's pretty straightforward. So run with the Spring Runner again. Configure it with a data JPA test. And what this is saying is, OK, for my test, I want you to auto-configure Hibernate, and I want an in-memory database, and uh, that's it. 
And then I'm going to use something else that's new in 1.4, which is this test entity manager class. And this thing is just like a slightly lighter version of the regular entity manager with some helpful methods for uh, doing things like persist and get. So I'll, I'll show you that a bit, a bit further down. And then we just have, uh, most of the tests are kind of straightforward. I want to make sure that I can't create an entity in an invalid state. So I'm just testing the nulls and spaces and what have you. And then this is really the main one uh, that I'm actually really interested in here. This is testing the logic of saying, OK, if I've got this user class, can I actually put it in the database and can I get it back out again? And does it look the same when it comes out as when it went in? Um, so this test entity manager's got this extra method, persist flush find, which is saying, write this object, put it in the database, flush it, uh, look at the ID that was added to that object, then throw the object away, and using the ID, get a new object back using that ID that we can then check. So this is just saying, stick this thing in, get it back out again, and then make sure that the, uh, the details match. So is the username the same here as what it was there? And we have a similar test here for the repositories. So uh, if you're using Spring Data repositories, just because you can type this magic method without an implementation, and it's going to generate a query for you, doesn't mean that you shouldn't test it, in my opinion. So um, <clears throat> again, pretty straightforward test, like stick something in the database, and then do the call to the Spring Data repository and make sure that it finds what we expect it to find. It's worth uh, digging into this annotation just a little bit more. If you jump into it, you'll see it's actually meta annotated with a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I won't go into all of it, but these auto configure annotations are particularly useful uh, because this one is saying this is how you normally would test a data JPA application. Uh, however, this auto configure test database is pretty useful because this one is saying I want you to take the database that you would normally auto configure and I want you to replace it with something else, an in memory one. So you can specify I want to replace with, uh, I want to replace any, I want to replace just the auto configured one, I don't, I don't want to replace it at all. And the nice thing here is that you can use this annotation in combination with existing tests. So if we take our existing um, application integration test that we have, and we run that again, so currently it works fine. Now I'm going to shut down uh, MySQL. <laughs> You have to be careful with typos. <coughs> um, OK, so MySQL's gone. If I run this test again, it's just like hanging and failing in a really horrible way. So in order to kind of get rid of this like, dependency on a real database, I can just add this auto-configure test database to this test, and then it's going to run again. So this is just saying, OK, I still want to do this test. I still want everything configured in the, in the same way. I still want the main application started. I still want a web server. But I just want to replace the database. OK. Yeah, it, so the question was, is it, is it using an in-memory database? And the answer is yes, it, it does. So as long as you've got one on the class path, it basically uses the same auto configuration logic that Spring Boot would do. It just says don't you know, start with a different set. OK. We have this remote service that's running at the moment. And it's. Uh, we're using Wiremock, and we're doing calls with uh, REST template. And there are a couple of things that we should be testing with this. We, we should really test that the, the service that we call with REST template is doing the correct URLs and getting the, the expected data back. Uh, we should probably be testing some failure scenarios, like what happens if I call this um, service and it returns a 404. 
And we should be testing the JSON to make sure that we can deserialize it and, and use it correctly. So let's start with the how would we simulate failures and how would we test something that's using REST template. So just to recap, this service here creates a REST template itself and then it uses it to do get for object with a URL and return some details. What you might not have noticed is I've got this protected method here and I've got this method so that I can get at the REST template from my test. It's protected so um, other people can't use it but my test can. And the reason is that I'm using something that's not Spring Boot specific but is part of uh, Spring Framework and that's the mock REST service server class. <laughs> so if you use mock REST service server and you call create server and you give it a REST template, what it's actually going to do is reconfigure that REST template and say, okay, don't go and call a real HTTP service. I'm going to tell you what to do. So um, what you actually configure the thing to do is you define it in a very similar way to the way that you define Mockito. So you, here's an example where I'm saying, okay, uh, this is the like happy path given this call when the result is successful, it should return the details. What I'm doing is like saying, okay, server, if you get a call to uh, this URL, uh, I want you to respond with a success message, and I'm going to give you this JSON payload uh, that I've, I've already written, which is just a, a regular resource file just down here. So, uh, oops. So this is just a, like a, an example file that I've just used for testing. And then do the real call with the service, which is going to trigger the rest call, and make sure that the details we get back make sense. And it's, it's kind of nice for the happy path, but it's really, really nice for the you know, simulating failures because you obviously, if you have a real service that you're calling, chances are you don't want that to fail. So um, mocking here, I think, is a really good solution. So here you can see like what should happen if, I, if a result is not found, and the answer is... Uh, you know, if I do this request, I'm going to respond when not found. And then I'm checking here that this particular exception is thrown. So does the service handle a 404 and say, okay, that needs to be thrown as this particular exception? And furthermore, you know, like, th does that exception have the right data in it? When it comes to the JSON, JSON testing is kind of sometimes a little bit tricky because there's a temptation to say, is it this string? And that's not really correct because obviously this JSON here, um, you can imagine if that was flipped round, it's still perfectly valid. And if you're just testing against a string, you, you have to deal with white space and all this other stuff. So boot14 is going to give you this new class called, uh, well, we actually have a few. We have Jackson tester, JSON tester, and a basic tester. And the way this class works is uh, it, it's basically designed to work with the assertj library's um, Fluent API. So the test itself is configured as a JSON test, and that's saying, set up my application context, inject myself with um, the, all the, the Jackson paraphernalia, all the object mappers that you've got set up, so that's all the standard stuff. Also, when it sees this class, it's going to say, I want you to set up one of these Jackson testers if you see it. And this is saying, I know how to test this particular class. So if we look at the, the test itself, we have uh, two methods, one for serialize, one for deserialize. So here I'm setting up an object. And then I'm using this Fluent API again. So assert that, which is the assert J assertions. When I write this particular object, I expect it to be equal to, and then there's a couple of ways you can do equal to, and this just shows you both of them. And I'm saying, I expect it to be equal to this JSON file, but using um, not necessarily you know, a string-based comparison. And you can also do nice things like you could say, does it have this particular JSON path element? Or if I extract, extract this JSON path element as a string, I can then define additional assertions on it. So I could say, you know, extracting that particular element, was it actually Honda? So it's, it's a nice way of testing like partial bits of your JSON and, and things like that. Uh, in terms of the other direction, you can take, uh, in this case, I've just got a string hard-coded. 
you could say, I want you to parse this, and then it's going to pass it through Jackson and make sure that it marshals correctly and, uh, and, and does the, the correct stuff. And I think this is really useful if you've got things like dates or custom formats and stuff, because if you don't, um, if you don't actually test that things are correct, you can sometimes find that Jackson serializes dates in a weird way or not quite what you're expecting or not what your customer was expecting. So it's, um, it's a pretty useful um, test to have, I think. I should just run both of those just to show you they work. OK. So what have we done here? Um, we've done this remote service test, which is nice. We've done the JSON test. Now what I want to do is kill Wiremock. So Wiremock's now gone. If I run these tests, you'll see they continue to work because all the mocking is done actually within the test class itself. If I run my integration test again, you'll see it's now failing because it's trying to do a call and it's, it's just getting no response back. So what I really want to do is, is I want to make this test a little bit, um, I mean, you could argue slightly less precise, but a bit more robust. I want to mock out a particular service in this t application test, uh, and I want to use a mockito mock so that I don't need to do a real REST call. Oops. So the way that you probably used to do that, if you've ever tried to use Mockito in combination with a Spring um, class, it can be a bit painful. You, you can do it with a configuration class. You can then define a bean method. Uh, you can then call Mockito's mock method and return the mock directly from the bean. And you often have to then deal with resetting the mocks because um, the way that the Spring test context works is it's aware of the fact that it's slow. So it does its best to try and cache things. So if you call the test um, with the same config file and two different tests use the same config file, the second test, if it's run at the same um, session, will, will go, oh, I already know, I've already got that in the cache, I'll just reuse it. And that normally works really well, but when it comes to Mockito, it, it doesn't work so well because you may have set up assertions in the previous test that are left sort of hanging around in the new one. So um, we're trying to make it a lot easier to, to run Mockito within the um, a, a regular Spring application context it, uh, within a test. And the way you do it is very similar to the way that you'd run uh, Mockito without it. You just use an annotation, but with mock bean. So this is, what this is saying is, um, OK, when, I'm, when this test starts, I, I'm going to find these annotations on fields. I'm going to create a mock of this interface. I'm going to look in your Spring application context. And if it doesn't contain a bean, I'm going to add one. If it does contain a bean and only one bean, I'm going to replace it. And then I'm going to set the field in the test itself. So it's just a convenient way of getting a mock up inside your test and available for you to use immediately. So in this case, all I'm doing is saying, when I uh, have this mock injected, which is going to replace the regular service that was doing the remote call, I want you to uh, mock out the get vehicle details with the VIN and just return some static data, which means if I run this test again, hopefully, it will pass. Right, so there you go. So you can see here, this um, idea of mixing the, the new features is something that you can do with your existing tests if you want to. And this is still starting up the real server and doing all the, the regular stuff. OK. Another test that's very common is wanting to test a slice for your MVC layer. And again, that was sometimes a little bit tricky. So there's another annotation that you can use if you want to do web MVC tests. So this one is saying, I want to set up Spring Boot. Please set up my application. But I'm only really interested in web MVC. So we'll actually find that if we run this test and we don't have the user details, um, the user vehicle details service that we 
um, discussed earlier, the test is going to fail because this, this annotation is not going to find every bean in your context. It's only going to find stuff that's um, for relevant for, for WebMVC. And furthermore, it's only going to find this particular controller because this is the one that I've specified for testing. So, uh, but it, it's not a big problem because we can just use the, the mock bean stuff to inject the, um, the sample service that we, uh, that we need. <clears throat> Something else that we do with this one that, that uh, you may have had to set up yourself previously is we can create mock MVC as an actual bean in your, in your context so you can inject it directly. So this means you don't need to say, I want mock MVC and I, I need to set it up in this particular way. This will just inject one that's already ready to run for this test. And then looking at the tests, uh, let's start with uh, getting a vehicle when uh, requesting text should return make and model. So again, mostly it's just about setting up the mock to do what I expect. So given a call with Donald, uh, then I expect to have some Honda Civic details returned. And then I'm using mock MVC to say, okay, mock MVC, perform a get request to this URL, and you can see that the username we expect to get picked out. And I want a text return and expect that everything's okay and expect some content that says Honda Civic. Now, um, when I spoke earlier about extracting that service that the controller can use, you can see this test is, is pretty straightforward. Like most of these tests are pretty clean in terms of what they have to do. I just have one mock um, set up and then I perform something and check that it does the right thing. So, you know, set up, uh, when I call it with JSON, does it give me JSON? And set up, when I ask for HTML, does it give me HTML? And then also I can do the failures in the same sort of way. So, so again, set up and I expect this time a particular exception to get thrown. Did that exception get translated to the correct status? Or did it fall through? Uh, if you compare that to the, to the other test we wrote earlier, um, so here's the service test that we've got. Here's the, the one that, that pretty much does the same thing. You can see if we hadn't extracted that logic, the, the setup cost in each of our tests would be a, a whole lot more because we'd have to set up two sets of mocks and two versions. So that's an, another reason why I think um, extracting that logic into its own class is a real um, sensible thing to do. There's another variant here that I should just show you which shows how you can use this um, mock MVC annotation. So as with the other ones, if you dive into this annotation, you'll see how it's built. Like What's the magic behind it? And again, you can mix and match those. So here's an example where I'm uh, not doing a, a mock MVC test. I'm, I'm setting up my complete environment, but I do still want mock MVC. So I'm, I'm, I'm not doing a single controller. I'm starting up my whole thing, but I do want mock MVC, and I do want the test database. So um, mixing and matching these annotations is perfectly fine and, and what we expect a few people to do. The last thing that I want to show you is how you can use um, the same MVC infrastructure but with HTML unit or Selenium. And this isn't a Spring Boot feature. It's just something that we've made easier for you to do. So um, previously, you could, you could do this, but you had to have some ceremony. What we do now in Spring Boot is if you happen to have HTML unit on your class path, we'll also auto-configure a web client. So here I'm, I'm effectively using a, an MVC test, but using the web client API to, to check that a particular, you know, calling a particular case, a page gives me some uh, response. So this is all HTML unit stuff. And we have the same setup with Selenium as well. So here you can see I'm auto-wiring uh, a web driver and then I'm using the web driver API to do the same assertions. So you're free to kind of mix and match those things or pick the one that you're most comfortable with. Um, I think that's it. So if anyone's got any questions, I'll, I'll happily answer them. <laughs>
notation? Okay, to write a composite notation is very easy. However, you already kind of depend on some composite notations like the Spring Boot configuration. Yeah. Maybe I'm using Spring Boot, but I have uh, components can enable auto configuration and configuration. And the, the amount of, of a notation is crazy. So why don't you, like, like, we usually type fast, right? So it's better to remember as, li as, less, as, as little as possible instead of having uh, a 50 annotations that you can start with. Like, right. for example, you have the mock annotation, right? Yep. Why to add, because I'm seeing it, why to add the mock bean annotation instead of having an attribute in a mock annotation? Okay, which will so be easier to, to find and to, to remember. And yeah. The capacity in our brain is limited while the typing speed is... So the, uh, just to recap, um, how do we decide when to add a new annotation? Uh, why are there so many? Uh, uh, like, uh, are, we, um, are we adding too many? And I think uh, the answer is it's trying to be a bit of a balancing act. Like, we, we, for instance, if you take, go back to Spring Boot before 1.2, then we didn't have Spring Boot application. And people would say, configuration, blah, 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 oh, component scale. But what we found was people were using those annotations, those three annotations, a lot. So it, it kind of seemed to make sense to, to say, OK, well, we'll offer you, you know, what we hope is the way to go. Um, and the other ones are kind of a fallback. Um, with the mock beam one, that's, that's an interesting one. Because um, actually, if you look at mock bean, mock bean is, um, in this package, which belongs to Spring Boot. If you look at mock, um, it's in Mockito. So we can't just add an attribute to that. Uh, and we need slightly different ways of configuring the thing. Um, so for instance, with a mock bean, you might want to, uh, you might be doing it by name. So we need a way of saying, OK, what's the name to replace? So we, we I mean, I, I guess we could have put a pull request into Mockito, but I imagine they're not going to be keen to add extra attributes for us. Um, in terms of the other ones, like my expectation is that the um, hopefully the ones that you you want to find will be well documented and pretty easy, and hopefully you'll end up using these ones. Um, so hopefully it'll be three. You know, like doing a data JPA test, it's data JPA test. I'm doing a web test, it's a the, these uh, meta annotations you know, are useful. And it's, I think it's definitely worth um, me pointing out how the thing works, because people sometimes say, I don't understand what's going on. There's too much magic going on with this boot. So, so I wanted to point out, OK, this is how we've done it. Um, but hopefully, those three are the ones that you're going you're gonna to use. Um, yeah, I, it's a balancing act. I don't know if we always get it right. I mean, the, definitely, for instance, the, the, uh, just going back to this. This one, um, so if I go back to the integration test, wherever it is, you can see here, uh, ignoring that one, this test got significantly less annotation, well, <laughs> like half the number of annotations and made them more readable when we upgraded. So sometimes we're trying to reduce the, the number of annotations you need to declare, but maybe not the ones you need to learn. Yeah, but you have to know about all of them. Which is like like you you probably remember the a, the the Java E5, they had the resource annotations, the age of annotation, then they get the inject annotation and yeah. so on. And why everyone liked Spring because there is only auto wire there. Well, let, let me and let me now, let me flip it around. Then. What would you rather do? Would you rather type four annotations on each of your tests or use one? So I mean, it's it's a balancing act that we have to decide. Like, what do people prefer? And not everyone's going to like the decisions. But you will know six annotations now. Like in your brain, you have the, the, the old five yeah. plus the new one. Yeah, and but I mean, if you summarize what? everything, like mm -hmm. instead of having to know 10, mm. you will know, I don't know, 61 because of the all sorts of combinations of this Yeah, thing. yeah. So it's, uh, I, 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 I understand the complaint. I don't, I don't know that there's a solution that's going to please everyone. So I'm afraid it kind of is what it is at the moment. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you very much.